Hi, welcome back to this, the last of my data updates for 2008. If you look at the last nine posts that I have on my data, I've focused on first principles. I've looked at how companies make their investment decisions, their financing decisions, their dividend decisions. I've looked at their cost of capital, but through all of these posts, I've assumed that following first principles carries its own reward, that it increases your value as a company. I believe that. But we also know that markets don't always behave the way you'd like them to or believe that they should. In fact, markets have a mind of their own. They sometimes reward companies for doing all the wrong things and punish other companies for doing all the right things. So in this post, I'd like to focus on the market pricing side of the equation. To understand where I'm going with this, let me go back to a contrast that I've used repeatedly before. I've talked about two different games that go on in the market. There's the value game and there's the pricing game. Let's look at the value game. We know what drives the value of a company. It's expected cash flows, growth, and risk. It's as simple as that. And the tools we use to assess value are either discounted cash flow valuations in all of its different forms or financial ratios, accounting analysis, intrinsic valuation. So values driven by cash flows, growth, and risk, you try to estimate it with, cash, with discounted cash flow models or with some kind of an accounting slash financial ratio analysis. Price is driven by demand and supply. You're saying, so what? The drivers of price are not cash flows, growth, and risk, though they do have an influence. They're mood and momentum. And the tools you use of your pricing are not discounted cash flow models, but multiples and comparables, similarly traded, similar companies that are traded out there and the prices they trade at, or technical analysis and charts. So if you look at the value process and the pricing process, you can't assume that the two processes are going to deliver the same number, unless, of course, you believe that markets are efficient. If you believe that markets are inefficient, as I do, there is a gap between value and price. And that is the gap that is at the heart of different investment philosophies. If you are an investor, here's what you believe. You believe that you can try to estimate the value of a company. And if that value is different from the price, you can try to exploit that by buying companies that are trading for less than their value and selling companies that are trading for more than their value. Implicitly, you're assuming that you can value companies and that markets eventually correct their mistakes. That's the investing philosophy. There's another way of approaching markets, and that's to be a trader. In a trader, here's what you try to do. You try to buy at a low price and sell at a high price. Why? You really don't care. You're focused on price changes, which means that you're buying underpriced stocks, not necessarily undervalued stocks, underpriced relative to other stocks just like it in the market. Here's what you implicitly believe if you're a trader. You believe that you can price stocks well. And secondly, you believe that, that you, can call, you, you can detect shifts in mood and momentum before the rest of the market does. Now, I know which camp I'm in. You have to decide which camp you're in, but you can already see that arguing that one camp is right and the other is wrong misses the point. I think I can become a better investor by understanding the price, pricing process. And I think you can become a better trader if you can understand the value process. So with that set up, let's talk about the process of pricing. The reason I want to emphasize this is much of what passes for valuation out there, and by out there I include banks, consulting firms, um, equity research reports, much of what passes for valuation is really pricing. And it doesn't surprise me. The mission of a banker, the mission of an equity research analyst is not to value companies, it's to price them. What troubles me, though, is why they use this masquerade of doing a discounted cash flow valuation when their heart's not in it. In fact, most banking discounted cash flow valuations are really pricing in drag. What I mean by that is you have a front of cash flows, but your biggest number, the terminal value, comes from a multiple. If you're going to do that, might as well do pricing and do it right. And to do pricing right, you've got to go through a four-step process. First, you've got to find similar assets or firms out there to the one that you're trying to price. If you're trying to price a Picasso, you've got to find similar Picassos. Good luck with that. If you're trying to price a Tiffany lamp, you want to find similar Tiffany lamps that have transacted in the past. Well, you might have better luck with that. If you're trying to price a stock, you have to find similar stocks. And already you can see the challenge you will face is finding similar stocks is really difficult to do. In fact, in practice, what you often find analysts doing is assuming that other stocks that are in the same sector and trade in the same market are similar stocks. That is this conventional wisdom. It's no longer true. But to argue that 
And automobile companies, like every other automobile company in India, and you can compare price earnings ratios across those companies, seems to be foolhardy. So here are two pricing practices that I think would stand you in good stead when you're trying to think of similar or comparable stocks. First, when you start off accepting the fact that you will never find a company just like yours. There are no identical equities. That's why equity arbitrage is an oxymoron. No two companies are exactly like. You have to accept the fact that when you go looking for similar, you have to make compromises. Now, the question, of course, is how much compromise and what does it mean? At the two ends of the spectrum, here's what you can do. You can try to find companies as close to yours as possible in terms of what? In terms of market you trade, in terms of market cap, in terms of market serve. On the other end of the spectrum, you can look for lots of companies that are in the same kind of business. Here's the trade-off. If you find companies just like yours, you're going to end up with a much smaller sample and less to control for. If you find a much larger sample of companies that are less like yours, it is true those companies will be dissimilar from your company, but you have more statistical tools you can use to control for differences. We'll come back and talk about this because I believe in the law of large numbers. I prefer larger, less similar company, a, a larger sample of less similar companies to a smaller one of companies just like mine. That's stop one. Second stop, you have to pick a pricing metric. You say, what are you talking about? The numerator, the, the number you're comparing across companies, you have three choices. You can focus on the market value of equity, right? You can focus on market capitalization or market value of equity. You can add the market value of equity to the market value of debt and come up with the market value of the entire company. Or you can take market value of equity plus market value of debt and then net out cash and non-operating assets to come up with the market value of operating assets or enterprise value. Market capitalization, firm value or enterprise value. Very few people use firm value because it's too difficult to control for differences in cash and cross holdings. So your choices are often either market capitalization or enterprise value. Here are some pricing practices you might want to keep in mind. If there are big differences in debt ratios across the companies you're comparing, you're better off comparing enterprise value multiples than equity multiples. And the reason is simple. If you have some companies with a lot of debt and other companies with very little debt, equity will be a very small slice and the companies with a lot of debt will be much more volatile and difficult to pin down. Better to stay with enterprise value multiples. So look at the leverage to answer the question, which multiple is better for you? With financial service companies, there's really no choice. You have to use equity multiples, and here's why. As I've said before, debt to a financial service company, a bank, an insurance company, investment bank, is not a source of capital. It's raw material. Even trying to compute enterprise value for a bank will lead you to pull your hair out, and numbers like EBITDA or operating income are meaningless. So stick with an equity multiple, price earnings ratios, price to book ratios, because that's what makes more sense for a financial service company. So at this stage, you've got your comparables, you've decided on a pricing metric, now you have to choose a scaling variable. What am I talking about? You cannot compare price per share across companies. Why not? If I did that, Facebook is a much more expensive stock than Twitter because the price per share for Facebook is much higher than Twitter and Amazon is a much more expensive stock than Facebook and Berkshire Hathaway is an even more expensive stock. Price per share for a publicly traded companies, in a sense, almost arbitrary, because by changing the number of shares, I can change the price per share. That's why we scale price to something. And here are your choices. You can scale price, uh, you can scale your, 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 your pricing metric to an earnings measure. You can be net income, operating income, EBITDA. We'll come back and talk about which one's right for you, but it can be a measure of earnings. It can be a measure of cash flows. EBITDA, for instance, is a measure of cash flows. It can be to book value, which is what the accountant tells your company's worth. It can be to revenues. You think, why would I use revenues? Well, desperation drives you up to the income statement. If most of the companies in your sector are losing money, you keep climbing until you're at a positive number. And for some of these companies, revenues might be it. You're saying, what if I have a pre-revenue company? Well, you scale your pricing metric to a pre-revenue variable. Like what? Like number of users, number of subscribers, number of downloads. So essentially what you're doing when you're scaling is taking your market value and scaling it to something that you can use to compare across companies. Now, here are some good pricing practices. One, be internally consistent. Remember I said you have a choice when it comes to to a pricing metric. You can either use a market cap or an equity value or an enterprise value or a firm value. The choice you make for your numerator should drive your denominator. 
Put differently, if you decide to look at market capitalization or market value of equity, your denominator has to be an equity number. Net income, if you're looking at earnings, book value of equity, if you're looking at equity, but it has to be an equity number. If your numerator is an enterprise value, value for the operating assets, your denominator has to be an operating number as well. EBIT, EBITDA, revenues, in book value of invested capital. Essentially, you're trying to be consistent because if you're not, you're going to bias your analysis. Second, life cycle matters. Which metric you use and which scaling variable you use will change as a company ages. So drawing on that, that, that vehicle I've used before, if you look across the life cycle, you'll see the kinds of pricing metrics people use will change as you go from pre-revenue companies where you might use a market cap to a revenue driver, number of users, number of subscribers, to, you know, to young growth companies, we use a revenue multiple. And then as a growth company starts to you get income, you might shift to price earnings ratios. And as a company matures and takes on debt, debt you might take move on to enterprise value to EBITDA and enterprise value to EBIT multiples. And then you get to the declining phase of your company where your company is liquidating, you might shift to book value multiples. So depending on where you're in the life cycle, you can see that the multiple use can shift. Which brings me to my fourth and final step in pricing. You've got to control for differences. I said, no matter how careful you are in picking comparables, there will still be differences across your companies on growth, on risk, on cash flows, on a number of other variables. The test to me of whether you're a good pricer is how well you control for those differences. A lot of equity research reports in pricing, here's what you will see, a lot of hand-waving, a lot of storytelling, but very little attempt to actually quantify the differences and bring them into your pricing. So here are some good pricing practices to keep in mind. First, if you're a believer that in the long term, fundamentals matter, even in pricing, then you can go back and find the fundamentals you should be controlling for with every multiple. Let me explain. If you have an equity multiple, here's what you should do. Go back to the simplest equity valuation model you can think of. Maybe a Gordon growth model, a stable growth dividend discount model. Then take that model and divide both sides of the equation by whatever your denominator is in your multiple. So if you're doing price to book, you're going to divide the both sides of the equation by book value of equity. And here's what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with an intrinsic value equation for the price to book ratio. You think, what the heck am I going to do with this? It's going to tell you the variables that drive price to book. And here are the variables that will drive price to book. It'll be return on equity, cost of equity, growth rate, and payout ratios. You can do this with any equity multiple. You can drive price earnings price to sales, even though that's not an internally consistent multiple. If you have an enterprise value multiple, go back to the simplest enterprise enterprise value model you can think of, which would be free cash flow to the firm next year divided by cost of capital minus the growth rate. Again, do the same thing you did with equity multiples. Divide both sides of that equation by the denominator of your multiple. So if it's revenue, you divide both sides by revenues, here's what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with an intrinsic value equation for the EV to sales ratio. And that, that intrinsic value equation is going to tell you the variables that drive EV to sales. And here they are. It's going to be a function of your after-tax operating margin, your EV to sales. It's going to be a function of your after-tax operating margin, your reinvestment rate, your cost of capital and growth rate. There you go. No matter what the multiple is, you can go back and look at the fundamentals that drive that multiple. So that's one way you can control for differences. Here's the other. Maybe you don't believe in fundamentals at all, which is fine. You're a pricer. You're a trader. Here's what I suggest you do. Look at what the market is basing its pricing on. You're saying, how the heck will I find that out? Take the pricing of each of the companies in your group. Look at all the data you can collect on those companies. And it doesn't have to be just fundamentals. Then look for correlations. Look to see which, which variable is most highly correlated with your multiple. I'll give you an example. When I priced Twitter in 2013, I value Twitter as well. When I priced it, I looked at social media companies and looked at how the market was pricing them. And in 2013, here's what I saw. The correlation between the, the, the pricing that I saw for companies, the market cap, and the number of users was by far the highest correlation. The market was pricing companies based on the number of users they had. You think that's absurd. That's because you're thinking in terms of fundamentals. If your job is pricing, you take what the market gives you and say, okay, I'm going to take the number of users at Twitter and multiply it by $100 a user, which is what the market is pricing users at. You see, that is so simplistic. That's what pricing is at its core. So having laid that foundation for good pricing, let's look at what the numbers look like across the globe. 
I looked at four sets of multiples. I started with PE ratios. After all, it's still the most widely used multiple in the world. And here's the cross-sectional distribution of PE ratios with a table embedded on what the numbers look like across regions of the world. And at least based on January 2018 numbers, the most expensive market in the world was China, followed by India, and the cheapest market in the world, at least the lowest PE market in the world, was Eastern Europe and Russian companies. Now, don't take take this the wrong way and take all your money out of you know, wherever it is and put it into Eastern Europe and Russian stocks. There might be good fundamental reasons why there are differences, but you can already see the vast differences across the globe. If you look at book value multiples, here's what you see. I've looked at price to book and enterprise value to invested capital. Here again, the cheapest market in the world is easy to catch. It's Eastern Europe and Russia. And Russia. The most expensive market? Well, that's, that's a tough call. The most Euro expensive market on a price to book ratio is, is India. So again, I don't know what to read into this. Maybe it reflects low book values, but in, you get a different call in the most expensive market. If you go to EBIT and EBITDA multiples across the globe, China goes back to being the most expensive market in the world or close to the most expensive. And Eastern Europe and Russia do their usual role. They're the, cheap, they're the lowest price stocks on an EBIT to EBITDA basis. And finally, if you look at revenue multiples, and multiples are revenues, it's tough to draw a judgment because revenue multiples can vary so much across sectors. Earnings, book value, EBITDA, revenue multiples. Take your pick. And if you look at the end of this session, you will see links to what these multiples look like across countries as well as across sectors. Again, don't do anything rash with it, but if you're going to do pricing, you might as well get some perspective. And that's essentially what you get when you look at what's high, what's low, at the distributional characteristics of these multiples. Thank you very much for listening.